Well, hey there, First Church. Merry Christmas and welcome. It is so good to be here with you at our Christmas Eve services in 2020. And uh, let me just tell you, we had so many plans for this year that didn't work out the way that we wanted. I mean, 2020 was like a big, endless buffet of cat poop sandwiches. And here we are, Hebron, online, DeMott Wheatfield, and I wanna welcome you. Thank you for celebrating Christmas Eve with us. Uh, you know, it's interesting because this year has just been so frustrating. My wife and I canceled our much-loved trip to see her family. We also canceled summer plans to see her family, uh, to protect some family with medical issues. And uh, right now, nevertheless, her sister is fighting for her life, and uh, her grandma actually died last week. And I know that a lot of families have issues this Christmas season, whether or not it's not seeing a family member or losing a family member, or so many of us are dealing with economic issues, or just being sick of the masks. I'm instituting a new holiday this spring, date to be determined, but we're going to call it end of pandemic mask burning celebration. Don't tell the EPA, but it's going to be great. You'll want to be there. But anyway, regardless, this has just been a dumpster fire of a year. And here we are at Christmas, the most wonderful time of the year. And so many of us are excited about doing things only to realize we can't do them. You know, and even if we do do some things that we wanted to do, there's a lot of tension. Like, like the question, am I going to kill grandma by celebrating Christmas? That's actually a real question we need to ask ourselves. Or what if I skip Christmas and it ends up being grandma's last Christmas anyway? Like then, you know, I did the wrong thing. And there's just a lot of tension. I feel like it's sweat inducing, stressful, anxiety inducing, like, oh, I don't know what to do. And I don't know about you guys, but I felt really stressed out and sweaty and gross because of COVID this year. It's a stressy, sweaty dumpster fire of a year. And the title of today's message is how do you celebrate God's goodness at Christmas when you don't feel good? And I think it's fortunate that we're asking that question because that is basically the center of what a lot of the Christmas story is about. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was this impoverished teenager from a really poor town. And imagine this teenage girl just chilling in her bedroom inside of her trailer with a crack screen iPhone 5S scrolling on the gram with, you know, a charger hooked up to it that's like frayed because it has no battery power and it's the only charger she's got. And she's watching all of her friends live the dream over Christmas break while she's in a room. When suddenly in Luke 126, it says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee. Her town is so small. It's like, it's a village in Galilee, right? It's a, you know, Demod is just a town south of Hebron. You know, I mean, it's just, it's there, right? To a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a tall drink of water named Joseph, a descendant of King David. So not only is he handsome, but he's a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favorite woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed. And I love that description. Mary, classic Gen Z, is like, wait, what? What are you doing here? Why are you, what's happening, right? Um, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin, right? She's confused, she's disturbed. We all had goals for 2020. We all had things we wanted to accomplish. But by the end of March, those were all gone. I just want you to know, Mary probably relates to us. She had goals for that year too. She wanted to get married. She did not want to be a surrogate for God's baby. And yet that's what happened. And I think a lot of us don't actually think about that. This lady was engaged to be married to this stud of a construction worker who also happened to be a part of the royal family. He owned his own business. I'd imagine he graduated from high school the year before and was super successful and super handsome, you know, cover model from GQ magazine. And he chose her and all her friends were like, Mary, you're so fortunate. Oh my goodness, you're living the dream, right? But they were secretly jealous. He was a good guy. He was waiting to be sexual with her until they were married. He honored God. He was good. And then all of a sudden, this angel's like, you're pregnant, right? So now all of her friends who are jealous of her are putting her on blast on the gram. Can you believe that, Mary? She's so terrible. They're sliding into Joseph's DM like, I would never do that to you. You should rebound on me. And it's tough. It's a bad situation. I mean, how many of you would want what Mary got? I sure wouldn't. I asked the teenage students in our um, student leadership program about this. And so many of them said, no, I would not want to be a surrogate for God. That is hard. I mean, if he asked me to, I would, but like that would be really hard to like as a teenager, be pregnant, raise this baby that's not mine. And it's hard. Mary thinks so too. It's clear from her, ter- her tone. She's confused and disturbed. But the angel Gabriel goes on clueless. He says, what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, and, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for the word of God will never fail. 
And Mary responded, and this is critical. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Notice, she doesn't say, I believe you. That's not what she says. She goes, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I'm God's servant, right? I guess, I mean, if it's going to happen, I mean, that's basically what she says right there. Why? Why does she not say, I believe you? Why does she not get excited in this moment? Because she's not sure what to think. She's got some concern. She's got some bad feelings. She's like, is this true? I don't know. And this is what I love. I love about this passage is um, the angel does not ask for blind faith, does he? What does he do? He tells her, hey, if you are doubting me, um, you can actually corroborate my story with your 60-year-old aunt or relative. She's pregnant. Go check it out so that you know I'm for real. And this is God throughout the Bible. He never asks for blind faith. He always gives us informed faith. And I feel bad for Mary in antiquity because they lack all the evidence that we have today, empirically, theoretical physics, biologically, scientifically, that God is real. Like we know he's real today, but Mary didn't have that, right? So God lovingly gives her this corroborating story so she can see that it's legit. And in verse 39, it says, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. I'd imagine Mary, you know, skipped her period. She's like, oh my goodness, I'm getting really nervous. I don't know what to do. So she goes and sees this relative. She's not sure what to think. She's like, I need evidence. I don't know. I feel really bad. She's a little skeptical. She can't talk to anyone about this. All her friends have put her on blast. They're laughing at her. Nobody believes her story. Her relationship with Joseph is falling apart. And can you just imagine the intense stress that she feels? She's walking up to that door like, ah, you know, and she's knocking on the door and it's like, what if, what if Mary's not pregnant? Or I mean, what if Elizabeth is not pregnant? What if, what if all this, what if I'm the only one? What if I sound crazy? She's sweaty. She's nervous. She's full of anxiety. But she knocks on the door and Elizabeth immediately validates the story. The text says that Elizabeth's baby in her womb jumped for joy when she saw Mary. After having this experience, not before, but after she believes. And she finally rejoices, singing the famous biblical poem that's titled The Magnificat. How does Mary do it? How does she choose to rejoice when she doesn't feel like rejoicing? Her year is much worse than our year 2020 has been. Nothing is going according to plan. Her fiance calls off the wedding. I mean, you can imagine that conversation, right? Joseph is like, we're done, we're done. I mean, you're lucky that I'm not gonna destroy you on Instagram, but we're done. And Mary's like, no, honey, don't you believe me? And he's like, I don't believe you. Stop lying to my face, that's ridiculous, right? But then an angel of the Lord appeals to Joseph, appears to Joseph, and he's like, yeah, she's right though. And Joseph is like, uh, you ever been so wrong? You're like, babe, babe, I'm so sorry. But you know, Mary's mad at him, like you didn't believe me and that hurts so bad, their relationship's in trouble. Ultimately, she gives birth, and Joseph is totally unprepared. They give birth in the worst possible situation, right? I mean, some of you guys, my wife, before she had a kid, she nested, and it was crazy. Like, Mary didn't get a chance to nest. She gave birth in a stable filled with manure, surrounded by animals. Like, that's where she gave birth. And yet, she chooses to rejoice. The Bible says she treasures all of these things in her heart. It says, but Mary treasured all of these things in her heart. She does not complain, She trusts and she worships even when things are bad. She's in these uncomfortable, stress-inducing, sweaty, gross, yucky situations, but it doesn't get to her. And I want to learn from Mary's life about how we can do that today. When we're in stressful, sweaty, gross, yucky, dumpster fiery situations, how can we deal with our bad feelings? My overarching thought is that um, bad feelings are like sweat. And I know that doesn't make sense right now, but it will in just a minute. My first point is, um, if you don't sweat, if you don't perspire, if you don't work out, you're going to get out of shape. You know what I mean? Physically. If you don't sweat ever, you're going to be, have you ever been so out of shape, you get winded going up the stairs? I had that happen a few years ago. I went up the stairs. I was like, oh, 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 because I wasn't sweating in my life. I wasn't working out. Have you ever met somebody who never sweats emotionally? They never let out their bad feelings. You know what I mean? They never process their emotions. And you know, it's like your dad or some dude in your family and you make him like talk about his feelings for like one second. And he's like, oh, I'm just so winded. I can't, I have to run away. Like I have to shut down for three days. Cause I just, you know, he's emotionally out of shape. People think that worshiping God means suppressing your bad feelings, but that's not it at all. That's not how Mary did it. She expressed her feelings. There's no doubt on the way to Elizabeth's house, she was like, uh, I don't feel good. God, this doesn't feel good. Like morning sickness, this whole thing. Like it's been... She was disturbed and upset, the text says, when she heard this news. There's nothing wrong with expressing yourself. In fact, I think we need to. I think it's part of how God made us. But this is a big deal. If you sweat and don't shower, you stink. It's my favorite line from Top Gun, right? Tom Cruise looks at Slider, says, Slider, you stink, right? Good line. Obviously, we've all been around people who forgot deodorant 
or didn't shower. You know what I'm talking about when somebody has like that really bad onions, B.O. It's like, whew, <laughs> that's bad. You come to a nice gathering and all your friends are there and one person around the table, it's like, oh no. Like my eyes are watering, they stink. I think bad feelings are really similar. We've been around people who have emotional BO. You know what I'm talking about where their feelings are just wafting everywhere they go. Like they never can handle their feelings. They never can deal with their feelings well. They go to everybody to talk about relational advice all the time. Like I talk to you, I got to talk to you and everything's a crisis. They're always angry. They're always whatever. It's up and down. It's a roller coaster. And their feelings are emotional BO. It's like, ah, right? It's super unhealthy. It's not fun for anyone. It's not good. I've got friends like that. And I think this is an epidemic in the United States today. We have bad feelings. We got feelings that stink. They're everywhere. People throw in temper tantrums all the time. If you don't agree with me, then you're a terrible person. I'll kick and scream. I'll throw a temper tantrum. If you don't agree, then you're bad, then you're a bigot, then you're this, then you're that, then you're terrible. I would never follow a God who makes me feel things that I don't like. I shouldn't have to feel things I don't like. Mary did not do this. She expressed herself, no doubt. But she did not let her feelings stink up her life. There was something that she did. She washed off her feelings. We can express our bad feelings. That's important. But we have to wash them off. So, so important. I know some of you might ask, well, how do I actually wash off my bad feelings? And I'm so glad you asked. Third point. We wash off our bad feelings with the truth. Body odor actually comes from bacteria breaking down the components of sweat. It's a chemical process that produces the smell. Sweat in itself doesn't smell. It's the bacteria releasing the gases of decay that actually smell. You're smelling death. And listen, sweat serves its purpose of keeping you cool. But after a time, it needs to be washed off or it will begin to decay. And the same is true with our feelings and emotions. It serves its purpose. It lets you cool off emotionally, but then you got to wash it off or it'll begin to decay in your life. Mary washes off the sweat of her bad feelings with the truth. She visits Elizabeth. She corroborates God's story. Her situation has not changed one iota. But what she does is she says, God, I'm going to choose to rejoice. I'm washing off these feelings. I've expressed them. I'm washing them off in your truth. And I think we must do the same. Sub point here, very important. I think we need to submit our bad feelings to the truth, not the truth to our bad feelings. Have you ever met someone who tries to make their bad feelings or make the truth be bent to their bad feelings? So often I hear people say, I could never follow a God that would fill in the blank. So I'm gonna, it's like you can change God's nature because of your feelings. That doesn't make sense at all. That's like saying, I'm really not okay with how gravity hurts so many people. We really need to upgrade our doctrines of physics to accommodate my discomfort with problematic gravity. I mean, gravity really is sexist. The way that it discriminates against older women with osteoporosis I'm just not okay with that. Like, we need to talk. We need to start. It's like, stop, stop, stop. You might have strong feelings about it. You can protest all you want, but the truth is the truth, right? Gravity is gravity. And Mary may not have been super comfortable or super happy with the whole Christmas story, but she processed her bad feelings. She washed them off in God's truth because the truth is the truth. And I think the big question this Christmas is, what is the truth for us? So we got these stinky feelings going on. We got these issues in our life. What is the truth that we need to hear? And the truth is, and this is the truth, something doesn't come from nothing. Intelligent design doesn't come from no intelligence. We know that God is real. And you might not have been to church for a long time. And you might not be necessarily like a follower of God, but I want you to hear this. The truth is you will stand before the victorious God of the Bible at the end of this life. It's not just something that I believe because of blind faith. It's something I believe because of overwhelming evidence. We have the corroborated eyewitness accounts from the Bible and secular sources from antiquity that are simply unassailable. Like God is real, not just God, the God of the Bible. God wins in the end. His love wins, his wrath wins, his justice wins. That's God. And whether you like it or not, you will stand before that victorious God. That is the simple, plain truth. And the beautiful part is, as a Christian, that means God's victory is transferred to me. And I don't feel great about some things this Christmas. Lots of things that God allowed, I don't feel comfortable with. But I'm going to process those bad feelings. I'm going to let them out. And I'm going to wash off in God's truth. The truth is he's real. He is the only way to heaven. And when I follow him, his victory is my victory. So I'm going to choose to submit and celebrate. And that's exactly what Mary did. After seeing Elizabeth, she sings this song called the Magnificat. And I want you to see what it's focused on. In verse 46, it says, Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. Did she feel like it? No, but she chose to. For the mighty one is holy. He has done great things for me. He shows his mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. 
His mighty arm has done tremendous things. Notice she doesn't sing about her situation. Oh, poor me. I'm on blast on Instagram and all my friends left me and my relationship is on the rocks and now I have this newborn baby and I'm a teenage. No, 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 no. What she does is she says, irregardless of my situation, God is great. And that is an instruction to us today. So many of us are lost with feelings stinking up our lives right now. We got emotional BO. And here's a reason. I think we're not washing ourselves off in the truth of God in 2020. I think that's the real epidemic in America today. And I want to say to you, this Christmas, come back to church and come back to God's word. I think for so many of us, and I talk to so many people that I love, and I just see, man, like things are falling apart in here and in here, and it's so hard and all these things. And it's like, the, the answer is always the same. When have you been back to church? How long? Well, I've been to church once or twice. I watch online. And it's like, yeah, you watch online. every. If you watch online like regularly, and that's awesome. I, I respect that. But for so many of us, it's like, yeah, I watch online while I'm vacuuming the house once in a while with the dog there, you know, while I'm like texting. And, when, and that's not it. That's not it. You got to wash yourself off in God's truth by getting engaged with his house, by getting engaged with his word. This January, we're starting a brand new series called A Trip Around the Sun. And we're going to look at the empirical scientific data behind how we know that God is true. It is going to be a super helpful series, especially for people who think like I do. If you're a, a big thinker, a critical thinker, it's going to be a really good series. But for some of you, you're like, man, I, I don't need the evidence. I know God is real. I just, I need to come back to God or I need to come to God. And you can do that tonight. You can text I'm in to 474747. We would love to connect you with God's truth. We would love to connect you with a relationship with Jesus this Christmas. In just a minute, we're going to sing this song called Silent Night. And I love the lyrics to the song. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. But think about the context of the song. All was not calm. All was not bright. It, they were in a dingy, dark, manure-filled stable. Mary was giving birth to the Savior of the world. It wasn't, it wasn't good in the moment. Her feelings were really bad. But she chose to wash her feelings off with God's truth, the truth that God wins, that God is going to bring great victory. And for those of us sitting here at the end of a really bad year, I want us to stand with generations of Christians before us. Generations of Christians who sang Silent Night on Christmas Eve of 1931, in the depths of the Great Depression, singing about how God was good. Christians who, in the depth of World War II, in December of 1942, when it looked like the Allies might lose, they sang Silent Night, Holy Night. And in the depth of the dark night of 2020, I want us to wash ourselves off in God's truth. The truth is that God wins, that he is good, and his grace is sufficient for you. I don't want this song to be a nostalgic tradition that's just, oh, it's great, we got candles. I want us to give God those bad feelings and say, in exchange, God, I receive your truth. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and for your victory. I receive it in the name of Jesus. We're gonna light our candles at our campuses. Please be careful with them, and you know, please do not blow them out. You can use your candle snuffer to put them out. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray, and we're gonna light the candles. God in heaven, we thank you for coming to earth so that we could know you. We thank you for your grace and mercy. And today as a church, we receive the truth that your grace is sufficient and that you win and that you make all things right. And as a church, we receive that and declare that over our lives this silent night. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen.